Did you know that Birthful has a weekly newsletter filled with tips, insights, calls to action, and relevant news? And when you sign up, you get free access to download my postpartum plan workbook. Go to birthful.com slash newsletter to sign up today. With the contractions, I can actually feel her moving down. And so I told them, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm pushing you know, you might want to check me. And they were they were in the middle of a shift change. So they were kind of like, okay, okay, we'll get to you in a little bit. You know, we're, we're updating our, our next staff member. That is multidimensional mama, musician, healer, and birth worker, Danelia Arechiga, sharing what was happening minutes before giving birth to the baby she was carrying as a gestational surrogate. A few days earlier, as she approached 41 weeks and her hopes for birth center birth dwindled, Danelia wasn't sure she'd be able to have the unmedicated birth she wanted, let alone experience the fetal ejection reflex. But to understand why she felt so strongly about this way of birthing for this baby, their intended parents, and herself, let's go back to the beginning. I'm Adriana Lozada, and you're listening to Birthful, here to inform your intuition. Welcome, Danelia. I am so happy to have you here on the show today to tell us your story. And before we get into that, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you identify? Sure. Thank you for having me. I live here in Long Beach, California, um, which is Tongva and Ahashman territory. I'm a single mom. I have a, a nine-year-old daughter and her birth actually led me into birth work. So I've been a birth worker for almost as long as she's been alive, <laughs> about nine years now. And I'm also an artist. I'm a musician, a writer, a songwriter. And the name that I've kind of given myself, the nickname is the multidimensional mommy, because I realized a few years ago that I didn't want to just be confined to birth work, that I could actually bring more of my gifts and my skills in other elements of my life into my birth work and vice versa. What motivated you to become a gestational carrier? Yeah. So my older sister, she has been working in fertility for a long time, about a decade. And she had asked me if I would be open to being a surrogate for a couple that she had been working with for quite some time. And at the time, I was very interested because, well, even now, I mean, I, I only have one child. I don't plan on having any more, but I really, really loved being pregnant and I loved giving birth, but I, I just don't want any more children of my own. And so it was, it was kind of an opportunity for them and for me to experience pregnancy again and then to be able to help this family complete themselves with this child that they've been longing for for so long. Broad strokes of how that process went of figuring out, because you hadn't done this before, it was your first time as well. So figuring out how to have those important conversations and determine who would be sort of taking the lead, right? Yeah, I think that my experience as a birth worker definitely helped the family feel more comfortable letting me kind of make some of those recommendations. Um, for example, I knew right away that if I was going to work with them, that I would want to try for a natural birth because I had a natural birth with my daughter. And it was just really important to me, especially because the, the actual pregnancy itself was so medicalized, right? Because it, there's a lot of medicalization that needs to happen in order for me to get pregnant in this way. And so I, I really wanted it to be as natural as possible. And they were completely supportive of that. They let me know that they, they trusted my experience and my suggestions. And that made me feel really comfortable moving forward with them. Additionally, I told them from the beginning that I wanted to possibly give birth at home or at a birth center. I wanted to avoid the hospital if possible. And also because it was important to me that they were as much a part of it as possible. And I knew that they would get a little bit more involved at a birth center with the care of midwives. And so as things progress and you're getting closer to that due date, what were their thoughts as things also got close. Were they showing any anxiety in terms of place of birth or in terms of the process? What were their concerns? 
Yeah, I think we all experienced a lot of uncertainty and anxiety leading up to the birth because I did pass the 40-week due date and we knew that we had a time limit with the birth center, meaning that if I didn't give birth by 41 weeks and six days, that I would have to be transferred to the hospital for an induction. What was going through your mind and what were you doing at that point when you're you're seeing this deadline of transfer to the hospital at 40 weeks, six days, if you're not you know, in labor by then? I was pulling out all the stops. I was really leaning on my community more than anything. Um, I had a wonderful doula named Carissa Raya, who has been featured on this podcast as well. And I also had a good friend of mine, Banketzani from Indigenous Mama, who uh, really helped me with a lot of body work in the weeks leading up to the birth and also the evening before the scheduled induction. Um, she stayed up with me all night and just, we did reboso techniques. We did herbal remedies. We did pretty much anything and everything we knew of to try to help the cervix at least get started so that the induction wouldn't be so intense. I was contracting pretty frequently, but they weren't very strong. And so as we know, we we really can't force our bodies into being ready if they're not. It's like the the saying, you know, when ripe, they will fall. When the fruit is ripe on the tree, you don't have to pull it. It'll just fall to the ground, right? So when I passed the due date, the midwives were able to administer a Foley catheter to get me started so that when I went in for the, the induction the following day, I could hopefully come in with some progress already. And then that's when Panketzani and I had worked on the reboso circuit and the herbal um, teas and things like that. And I was able to get from one centimeter when they put the Foley bulb in to three centimeters when I showed up to the hospital. So it did make a difference. Today's episode is brought to you by Beekeepers Naturals, creators of clean science-backed remedies that naturally support your daily health. For example, their Bee Soothe cough syrup tastes nothing like the yucky artificial cherry-tasting cough syrups we grew up with because it contains no drugs, dyes, or refined sugars. Instead, Bee Soothe is made up of powerful immune supporters like pure buckwheat honey, edelberry, chaga mushroom, bee propolis, and olive leaf extract. We love it and take it to ward off itchy throats. Beekeepers Naturals has other amazing products like their bee-powered honey, which is a therapeutic blend of propolis, royal jelly, and bee pollen to support all-day energy and your immune system. Check out Beekeepers Naturals to try Bee Soothe Cough Syrup before it sells out. Save 15% on your first order today by going to beekeepersnaturals.com slash birthful. That's B-E-E-K-E-E-P-E-R-S. N-A-T-U-R-A-L-S dot com slash birthful to get 15% off. I want to explain what a Foley catheter is because you must have had some dilation if they were able to put it in because you need to be at least one centimeter for it to be inserted. And then it's it's a little balloon that gets pumped with water and mechanically expands mm-hmm. the cervix for that with that pressure from the water inflating. And it continues creating that pressure until three centimeters because then the balloon can't go anymore. That's as big as it gets. And then it falls out. So that's what you experienced. Right. Right. So they put it in, I did the circuit and then it fell out on its own. And so that's when I went to the birth center to be assessed. And they did say that it, that I was three centimeters, but um, baby's position wasn't ideal. They thought that baby might be asynclitic and also the cervix was posterior. So, so then I went back home and tried a little bit longer <laughs> to avoid the induction. <laughs> what time are we talking about? Um, this is like 3 a.m. And your yeah. deadline for induction is what time? It was the next morning, 7 a.m. So you're like four hours away from having to, you know, go in. Yeah. So middle of the night, you're doing all these things. They're slowly making change. Then what happened? I went home and I I intended to continue working on the circuit that I had been practicing. Um, Different things like squats, reboso, you know, walking, uh, knees up, type those types of th- movements. But I, I was really tired. I was really tired from all the movement, all the anxiety, all the pressure, um, the contractions that I was feeling. So I ended up taking a nap <laughs> and I ended up sleeping longer than I intended to. 
But honestly, I feel like it was needed. You know, it was necessary because my body needed to rest and I needed energy to go into the hospital. I, I needed to prepare myself for that. And I love a nap during early labor. It can be so restorative and sort of get you out of that thinking brain and let your body do the process. Absolutely. I needed that for sure. And I think I just needed time to process what was about to happen, you know? So the majority of my morning, the next morning when I did have to go into the hospital was spent moving really slowly and really cherishing every last minute that I had with my daughter before I had to go to the hospital. That was really hard for us that I had to leave her because because of COVID, we had been inseparable, you know, since the pregnancy started. So we just spent some time loving up on each other before that. And where are the intended parents in this process right now? So they were home and they were notified that I would be going into the hospital. So their plan was to meet me at the hospital when I got there. And were they going to let both of them into the room? No, unfortunately, only one of them was allowed in as well as my doula. So the hospital's policy was that only a doula and one, one additional support person could be with me. So the mom ended up coming with me to the hospital. I was scheduled to be admitted at 9 a.m. And I believe we got there a little bit closer to 9 30, 10, because I was I was showering. I, I was kind of dragging my feet a little, if I'm being honest. <laughs> and so by the time I got checked in, I was I was actually officially checked around 11 a.m. And that was I was about four centimeters at that point. I was starting to feel more excited, like, okay, we're here. It is what it is. Let's just do what we do best, right? As birth workers, what do we do? We turn that hospital room into a birth cave and we make it dark. And we, you know, if the, if the client wants it, of course, and I did, I wanted, I wanted it to be dark. I wanted it to smell good. I wanted to have my music. Um, and my doula was amazing. Carissa was amazing at creating that space for me. She kind of just recreated the, the cave that I had created in my room in the hospital. And, I immediately felt a lot better. And I was like, okay, let's do this. (laughs) Excellent. So you made the space yours and you were mentally ready. You know, your Mm -hmm. space, your mind, you're ready to go. Was your body ready to go? It was. Um, It started to work. It started to move. The contractions got more intense and more, you know, closer together. Even though I was there for an induction, I wasn't actually induced the doctor and the, the nurses had spoken to me about needing Pitocin if I wasn't progressing by a certain time. I just kept asking for more time. And I think that being a birth worker definitely helped me in this situation because I felt very confident advocating for myself. And before I knew it, I started feeling pressure, you know, and I started going to the bathroom a lot. And that's usually a sign that things are moving along because we feel like we need to poop, but really it's the, the pressure of the baby moving down. I still experienced some moments of doubt, you know, like, like, oh my gosh, this is going to take forever. They're going to give me Pitocin. But my body was telling me the opposite. My body was saying, no, you're fine. This is happening now. Because I, I went from five centimeters to eight really quickly, like in the matter of an hour, maybe. And this was right around the time that the doctor was saying, okay, we've given you lots of time. We're going to have to give you Pitocin soon. And that's when I was like, actually, you need to check me because I feel like I'm going to (laughs) push. So um, I was able to, you know, access that higher consciousness that we tend to experience in labor, especially if it's an undisturbed birth, right? Because I remember at one point putting my headphones on and just going into my zone and really like speaking out the, uh, the sounds that my body needed to allow myself to move through these different intense surges that I was having and listening to a a mantra in my ears that reminded me that I was safe and that I was secure and that I was going to be okay. I've been telling you about Charlie Banana reusable cloth diapers for a while now, but I want to remind you that because you are my listeners, you can get an unheard of 31% off your first order when you go to my special URL. That's 31% off the softest cloth diapers. And I know cloth diapering might sound overwhelming, but honestly, Charlie Banana makes it so easy. 
With cloth diapering, it's not all or nothing. You can start using Charlie Banana one-size cloth diapers on the weekends or just at night. You could literally start with just one diaper. Once you try Charlie Banana, you're going to love them. But if you don't, they have a great money-back guarantee, so there's no risk. Take advantage of my superb offer and order Charlie Banana reusable cloth diapers today. Make sure you get 31% off your first purchase. Go now to charliebanana.com slash birthful and use promo code birthful at checkout. This is a limited time deal, so don't wait. Order now at charliebanana.com slash birthful and enter promo code birthful. So you're deep in the zone. Things are intense. You're eight centimeters. You are in the bathroom and suddenly you get more pressure. Tell me about it. I always tell people like when you give birth that that intensity it's it's indescribable because after it's over it's almost like you forget about it it's almost like you can't verbalize it you know but I do remember very distinctly feeling the baby moving down into my pelvis I could actually feel her almost like scraping the insides of my pelvis and as as much as that does not sound comfortable <laughs> I mean it's not but physiologically, I could feel it. And it it was amazing to me because I don't remember feeling that with my daughter's birth. And it told me that this baby was coming soon, you know, with the contractions, I could actually feel her moving down. And so I told them, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm pushing, you know, you might want to check me. And they were, they were in the middle of a shift change. So they were kind of like, okay, okay, we'll get to you in a little bit. You know, we're, we're updating our, our next staff member. And um, my doula too was like, um, you're going to want to check her. Like she's, she's, I mean, I was grunting. I was like actively pushing, you know, with the fetal ejection reflex, as you know, you know, you can't really stop it. So I was, it was just happening and it all happened so fast. The baby just kind of came out uh, before the doctor even could make it into the room. And be- the new nurse that had just come on was kind of like, you know, at a loss for what to do because it happened so fast. Let's paint a picture. So where are you in the room right now? They did end up checking me, but it took a little while. And by the time they checked me, they were like, oh, you're complete. And I was like, I know, I've been telling you I have to push. <laughs> and so I was actually on my back flat, which I I was not happy about, you know. But it, again, it happened so fast, it was hard to get into a position that felt better. And yeah, baby just kind of slipped right out into one of the nurse's arms. It was funny because some of the nurses were like, okay, just breathe, you know, don't push yet. The doctor's coming. One of them kind of looked at me and was like, if you have to push, just push. Don't worry about it. You know, like we'll, we'll catch this baby. I was like, thank you. Like that's, I know, you know, I know this baby's going to come out whether you catch it or not, but I appreciate that, that reassurance. So then after the baby's out as a surrogate and an intended mother in the room, like what happens? How, yeah. how does bonding happen? So Carissa actually facilitated the mom being more involved because she was kind of standing on the on the sidelines and Carissa was like come here come here you know your baby's coming and I even told her I said I said take your sweater off because when, as soon as she comes we want you to you know her to go to you um and so she was kind of like right next to me just watching it all unfold and baby ended up coming onto my chest or on, actually onto my belly briefly while they just assessed her And then they moved her over to the warmer and then the mom went with her to the warmer and just kind of talked to her and was there with her. But because, you know, the doctor wasn't there, it was a little bit of a delay with getting baby right onto mom's chest. But um, as soon as they could, you know, mom was able to to hold baby and then dad was able to come into the room because he had been in, in the chapel, actually. He was in the chapel at the hospital saying his prayers, just, you know, thinking about us. And it was really beautiful once they could all be together. And I was just so relieved. I just had such a a feeling of relief, like, oh, that pressure had finally just subsided. And finally, she was here with her parents. It was beautiful. For the mom who was in the room, did she let you know later what the experience was for her? And as soon as the baby came out, what was her response? I think she was just in awe, you know, just in awe that this baby was finally here. Honestly, I haven't had a chance to really sit down with them and really ask those questions. Like what emotionally, what did that feel like? I would love to actually sit with them and and have that conversation. But from what they did tell me, she was just very grateful. She was very grateful that, 
you know, I was able to give birth to their baby. And also that I was so committed to the natural birth, you know, like, I don't think they understood how committed I was, but I was trying to avoid that induction at all costs. Did she feel as committed as you or did at any point, did she have any hesitation? She would ask me often, like, are you sure about this? Are you sure you don't want medication? And I'm like, no, I, I think I'm okay. You know, um, for me, the the need to have an unmedicated birth is more about limiting the amount of recovery as well. I also wanted to be able to feel what it felt like to give birth. If, if I had some type of epidural or pain relief, I may not have felt that intense feeling of the baby moving into the pelvis, you know, but that's just me. I wanted to feel that. And the baby came out screaming and pinked up and was doing great and fine. She was doing well. Um, she did have some complications after birth. She had a small hole in her lungs that they discovered the second day of, of life. So she ended up having to go to the NICU for a while. And that kind of affected our postpartum plans because originally we had planned to, in an effort to facilitate bonding for the parents and also to stimulate breast milk, we had planned to stay at a hotel after birth so that I could do skin to skin with the baby to get breast milk going. But because she ended up being admitted to the NICU for about a week, we didn't get to do that. And so I was pumping. I was trying really hard to make sure that I got some type of breast milk so I could give it to them so that it could help her, especially because she was in the NICU. And they were able to do that. They were able to give her the milk that I was pumping. So as part of the surrogacy, you guys included or negotiated that you would make sure your milk came in and provide breast milk for them? Yes. For yeah. how uh, long? Um, the goal was three months, but I ended up, my milk supply ended up dropping around the second or third week postpartum. Um, and that just goes to show you how powerful hormones are, right? Because if that baby's not with the birthing person, I should say, it's really hard to facilitate breast milk production. And I was doing all the things I was, you know, eating and drinking all the things that help boost the hormones responsible for breast milk. But I think because there was a disconnection, you know, as far as it not being my baby, it's just very different. So I'm, I'm actually really proud of my ability to pump as long as I did, because, you know, not having baby nearby to stimulate that can be a little tricky. Right. And you didn't have, you know, 24-7 access to skin to skin with this baby so that they mm -hmm. could eat on demand 12 times, 10 times a day, however many times they wanted. So I can see that being a little trickier. Being a surrogate and giving birth, what was the hardest part of it all for you? I think the hardest part towards the end was considering having to go to the hospital first and foremost, because it, it was so far from what I wanted. I only agreed to be the surrogate because the intended parents were open to a home birth or a birth center or working with midwives. So when that, when that possibility came up, it was really, really hard for me to accept because it was just so far from what I wanted. And I feel like my body just shut down because I was like, oh, I don't want to go there, you know, but it was a great experience. And I'm, I'm really glad that I got a chance to, to challenge myself to face that obstacle and still overcome it. But I can't attribute that to, you know, just myself. It, it was really a team effort. It was really a community effort from all the support I received throughout my whole pregnancy and birth and postpartum. So... What was your favorite part of the whole experience? I think I loved pregnancy. I loved being pregnant. I felt so beautiful. I felt so good in my body. And with that pregnancy came so many revelations about myself. So being pregnant was absolutely my favorite. And then just the birth itself, just the, the, the feeling of giving birth to this little human that her parents had prayed and longed for for so long. It was just magical. It was really beautiful. One of the questions I get asked a lot about the surrogacy experience is if I experienced any type of grief or sadness when it comes to having given birth and then this baby no longer being with me, but being with her parents. And 
what I want to say about that is that just like I said, there's that disconnection. As much as I bonded with this baby in some way because I carried her for, you know, nine months, the bond that I created with her was always one of friendship. It was never one of ownership of like, this is my baby. It was always like, this is a friend. I'm, I'm doing this as a favor to this family as a friend. And I'm carrying this baby for them as a friend. And so I'm going to return her to her parents. So she was never mine to begin with. You know, I didn't give up a baby. This baby was never mine to begin with. I was holding her, growing her temporarily for her parents because she was always theirs, you know. Would you do it again? That's a great question. Um, I haven't decided yet. I'm, I'm still very much recovering. You know, I, w- I would love to, to be pregnant again, but realistically, my body is telling me to take it slow and just really be present. So thank you so very much for coming on today to share your story. This was really special. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the space. That was Danelia Arechiga, and you can find her on Instagram at The Multidimensional Mommy. I hope your main takeaway from our conversation is that flexibility and adaptability are key skills to hone during labor. Even though she did not want to, Danelia created space to process the changes to her birth plan and then went into the hospital from a place of readiness. She and her team turned the clinical space into her birth cave and they worked together with the nurses and care providers as they advocated for her wishes. Also, that fetal ejection reflex is a powerful thing. One thing you can do for you is to learn more about the fetal ejection reflex and ways you can support it during labor for a more flowing pushing stage. For starters, listen to our birthful episode on rethinking the pushing stage. The one thing you can do for the rest of us is to follow and support the work being done by Danelia along with Marisol Garcia at La Fuente, a community space providing safe, uplifting, and empowering support for new and expectant families in Long Beach, California. Follow them on Instagram at La Fuente LB. You can connect with Birthful on Instagram at Birthful Podcast. And to learn more about Birthful and my birth and postpartum preparation classes, go to birthful.com. Birthful was created by me, Adriana Lozada, and is a production of La Antigua Williams & Co. The show's senior producer is Paulina Velasco. Jen Chien is our executive editor. Cedric Wilson is our lead producer. And Kojin Tashiro mixed this episode. Thank you for listening to and sharing Birthful. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, and everywhere you listen. And come back next week for more ways to inform your intuition.